Marcia Bridges with Living Man and Ministries, and I'm here with Brother Spencer Scott with Nevada Ag here in the northern Nevada desert. Uh, today, Brother uh, Spencer is going to give us some basic gardening techniques here on this farm. So, Brother Spencer, uh, let's get started. All right. Um, we're going to start uh, just, just with uh, rototilling. This is a diesel tractor, d diesel, diesel uh, rototiller. So just get it started. It has a preheat cycle. It's pretty warm right now, so we shouldn't need the uh, shouldn't need the preheat as much. So, so can I ask you why you chose diesel instead of just regular gas? I chose diesel because I can store diesel on on my location. It doesn't have the flash point that gasoline has, mm -hmm. so it it just it's just a better it, it's a better mech, a better tool okay. to have a diesel product that torque that the tractor has is much much better okay. this is one of the better ones that came out it's an older tra older uh, older tiller okay it's made by Kubota it's an AD 70 okay it gives you forward and reverse tines as well as two three gears going forward and one one in reverse okay so so it's a tremendous tool so the storage of diesel mm -hmm. uh, is why is it better than gas the storage of diesel is just it's not as volatile as gasoline okay. gasoline has a high flash point and diesel doesn't okay so as well as if you store gas for a matter of a month or two or better, mm -hmm. gas starts going backwards. You have to put a stabilizer in gasoline to keep it for an extended period of time. Okay. But most diesel units will burn fuel oil or they'll run the regular the regular diesel that's you know okay. that, that you can buy at the pump. Okay. But you can keep it without it going bad as fast as the gasoline. Okay, so that's, that's great information. That was a that was a reason for me. Okay. So we'll get this going and and, uh, and we'll, we'll we'll go through uh, nice about this tractor it's got since it has forward spinning tines mm -hmm. if the soil is nice like this is wet and it's and it's it'll, it'll cut into it really easy okay if you've got hard packed soils the reverse mechanism gives you a better cut and then you okay. can come back and do the forward okay so It's wet, but it's still a little hard.
we'll go back through this one here. Um, the depth that you want to create the seed bed. So we made one short pass so we're just going to come back again okay. with another pass. Now I, I noticed that this section right here is a lot finer than this section. And why is that? Is that yeah. because you did the reverse on this portion? Yeah, the reverse the reverse cuts the soil a lot differently Okay. and gives you a little bit of a finer cut. Okay. But but what we'll do is, is just make, we'll make a couple passes through. And you typically have to do that to get the depth that you want. Okay. Just make a few passes through, and it, it just it'll work things out. Well, you know, when I first started gardening, I was told mm -hmm. that you really needed to dig like uh, four or five feet. Or is that a true statement? Um, different types of plants um, have, require different root depths. Okay. Um, depending on what you're going to grow, like right now, it's it's we're getting toward our fall season. Right. So. Typically, our crops now are going to be the, a lot of your greens, a lot of your brassicas, your right. your cabbage and broccoli, and chard. we've got turnips in and chard and you know any of your greens and, and kales and so forth. Okay, they're not a heavy, heavy feeder. Okay, their root system isn't set deep. Okay, so four, five, six inches that you prepare the to the soil and put your nutrients in it well, should, should 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 be enough. That okay. should that should really help you to do what you need. Okay, so. We'll turn it back up and... right thing to do to till in wet soil it's it'll it'll be much easier on your equipment as well as for it as well as yourself okay if you're tilling in moisture soil because okay. it's gonna it's gonna till better uh -huh. and it's gonna get just it's just gonna, it's just gonna make things better all the way around okay but not fully saturated but just not fully saturated just yeah. just where the moisture has gone through just very very well when we've got moisture in your soil pretty well okay. then it's gonna it's it's just gonna be easier on your equipment okay and yeah. then another question is mm -hmm. why do we have to till at all well Tilling is important because you've got to create a seed. You've got to create a seed bed mm -hmm. so that that new seedling it's got it's got pretty good power when it comes out. But it needs it needs a fertile bed and a soft bed in order for the first roots to be able to to sink in and then to start moving down moving down. down deeper. Okay. Typically, the soil that's compacted that it's it, the pan is too too hard. Okay. Yeah. Now there are no, you know, there there are movements toward no-till mm -hmm. circumstances right. um, when you're farming, and that's good once you've already gone through a field and you've tilled it and you've put in a principal crop, 
you're not going to have the compaction that you're going to have on something that has not been never been tilled before, not okay. been dealt with. Okay, so there so. are some so forms of no-till gardening that can be done Absolutely. after a field has been tilled. Absolutely, after it's been plowed and you've gone through and you've loosened the soil up and you've and you've turned it over, you've gotten your organic matter in well it? blended in it. Okay. And for instance, if you, if you come through and you and you and you grow corn, you put corn over that area. Corn's a real heavy feeder. Right. So you come through and you cut it off, cut the stalks off, and you cut them low to the ground, mulch them, and put them back on the soil. You could come back in and open areas up and come back in with another crop. You can do that. But I thought that corn was a nitrogen uh, sucker, and that you can't really plant it in the same area because of that. Corn is a very heavy feeder. You would, if you came back in an area where corn was planted, you'd be putting another another crop in. You wouldn't come back with the same one. Okay. Yeah, be, okay. that way you have your rotation. And you want to okay. make sure that, that throughout your practice of growing, that if I planted beans here this year, then I'll put something back next year. Okay. Like, every year I'm changing. Okay. I'm always changing wh what's, what's in the soil. Okay. And this place, what's it's changing for next season. Okay. Always rotating, always rotating. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. So, All right. So with tilling... Just basic, make enough make enough passes over over an area if it's been hard pan okay. that you've got the seed bed that you need. Rake it out, put your water lines in, irrigation down or otherwise, or garden mm -hmm. hose. Mm -hmm. Put the seeds and all your nutrients and go to work. Amen. Yep. So that's all right. it. All right. So, um, um, so you want to go through the garden now? Yeah, we can go through. Um, we we can go through. Okay. On. This is just one field. It represents about it represents about a three quarters of an acre, mm -hmm. um, and this is one. This is our this is our last field that we do. We do early plantings. I always do early plantings, mm -hmm. and then I'll do a late planting, and then I'll and this is this represents a late a very very late planting. Okay, a, a late spring planting. No, a late. It'll be a late summer season planting. Okay. Like most of what's here was put in right about July. Okay. Right around June, July, except wow. except the beans. Okay, we've got beans that came in earlier, okay. so I don't put a lot of energy into this field um, necessarily. It will make, and I'm not our our season will usually extend till about October before we get frost really really strong. Okay, um, but the beans have already finished. Okay, now beans beans are one beans are one crop that it's it it has a clock on it. Most of your crops have a clock on them. Okay. So I see when, some beans here. Mm -hmm. When beans have finished, they're going to die back and start getting what looks like chlorosis, mm -hmm. the yellowing of the leaf. Mm -hmm. the, it'll just the plant will just turn a switch off. Okay. It's like I've I've set enough beans. I'm done. Okay. And we're and, and and it stops. One thing to remember when you're growing beans. Now, always remember that most of your legumes are nitrogen setting plants. Right. They will on the they will on the nodules of the the roots will create nodules and and mm -hmm. nitrogen will, will will be affixed to those you know to those to those nodules on the roots, mm -hmm. but the plant does not have enough energy in itself to create the create the crop. In forty five days, typically most of your legumes are going to start setting nitrogen. Okay, but the plant will not have enough power to develop the beans unless you have soil that has a good exchange property okay. or CEC property that's just soil that's able to hold the nutrients and hold them very very well now, now can you tell me what CEC stands for CEC CEC stands for cation exchange capacity okay it's you the goal with with your garden is to put enough organic matter in your garden so that it will be able to hold the nutrients that are in it okay you want very very rich well well turned over soil mm -hmm. and you want actively decomposing organic matter in your soil. Okay, so now we just did a, a tilling demonstration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm about to plant a new field and I till. Mm -hmm. Am I supposed to put all these things and then till it again? What I would do is is I would put I would put my organic matter, I would broadcast it over the field mm -hmm. and then either plow it in, plow the organic matter in or till that organic matter into the soil. Okay. 
you can, you can do all of it in one step. You can put your nutrients. If you've taken soil samples of your, of your property mm -hmm. and you know what's missing, mm -hmm. you, can, you can do that very, very well. Mm -hmm. So if it's, you need calcium as a structural element, almost every field mm -hmm. or every, any area that you're planting, calcium is a structural element. You, you can't okay. start without calcium. Okay. So make sure you've got lime. Mm -hmm. If you've got high rainfall areas, you can put lime in. If your rainfall areas are lower, mm -hmm. gypsum is a very, 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 very good tool. We use gypsum here because we have a very, very low rainfall. Okay. So gypsum works out so well if you for have, us. So if you have high rainfall, then you need to use the power. Want we'll, to we'll use the lime. Okay. So we'll put lime in, potassium, the Magnesium is always goes in when we're planting. Mm -hmm. We'll always put our, we'll always put our, along with those sulfur. But most of our most of our fertilizers have a, have a they're a sulfate, magnesium sulfate right. or potassium sulfate. Mm -hmm. um, so the sulfur is there. So the sulfur is typically there in the fertilizer, but we make sure we always have those there. Now for phosphorus is another one that we always add. Okay, now how mm -hmm. often should they do it once the plants start to come up? You only do it one time because most of those have to be in the root zone. Calcium's got to be in the root zone. Okay, so I have to Phosphorus do needs to be in the root zone because they're not mobile. Okay. So they've got to be in the soil. Your magnesium is a, is a negatively charged ion, so okay. it, it's mobile. It'll move with the water. If you've got a problem with magnesium, you can correct it when the plant is in the ground and mm -hmm. it's being planted and, and, you're, and it's growing. So I can put magnesium You can You can add magnesium if you notice that you've got a deficiency of it, just like with your nitrogen. You can always side dress with it because it's it's mobile in water okay yes okay but so t typically i just need to thoroughly fertilize initially put your put your fertilizers in that that your soil is telling you that it needs your soil samples are telling you that you need put mm -hmm. those in mm -hmm. and then and then from there till those in with your organic matter mm -hmm. and get those incorporated in your soil and you're pretty much good you can okay. you can start planting okay now i have point. one more question mm -hmm. So when you, okay, let's say I want to prepare my field for spring this winter. Okay. And I want to go ahead and till and put all that stuff in. Is it better to do it before or right at spring or should it settle into the soil? I would, I would do this depending on what kind of amendments you're using for okay. organic matter. Okay. Some people are very comfortable with using manures, animal manures. Mm -hmm. I would caution to just be very careful that you know the supply that you're getting the from. supply chain from uh -huh. and then you can be comfortable with using your animal manures but but then with them perfect thing to at the fall at the end of the season mm -hmm. is to put those or get put the manure into the soil and get it in incorporated in and let it be breaking down and actively decomposing over the winter time okay for spring for spring well mm -hmm. let's say like myself i mm -hmm. don't use any animal products in my garden okay. no manure no blood meal yes, no yes, feathers yes. Yes. none of that i yes. don't want any of that in my food good so i want to know i i, I with my understanding that i needed to put all the nutrients whether it was uh beginning mm -hmm. gardening or just using mm -hmm. uh manure mm -hmm. in the winter and let mm -hmm. it settle and sit so mm -hmm. that a few months later the rain would you know cause it to go down into the right. soil if you're if you're doing veganic gardening mm -hmm. you can there's there's no harm in starting to put put all your you can put your calcium in you can do your lime treatment or your calcium okay. treatment you can do that bef in this in the fall of the year okay you can put that in the soil you can certainly put your phosphorus in okay um the magnesium I wouldn't do. I wouldn't apply my magnesium that early. Okay. Um, okay. But the, the the nutrients that are not going to be mobile with water that are stable in the soil. Okay, those are the ones we should apply. Apply those. Okay. Get them in. Okay. And 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 let them let them be there so you don't have to address that next spring. And then the ones okay. that are more mobile, mm -hmm. then you want to apply those just before you're preparing your seed bed for the next season and 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 get them in and get them going. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I have one more question before mm -hmm. we move on. Mm -hmm. Because this is turned yellow now. Mm -hmm. Are the the current uh, beans there not edible? This is a signal to me when the when the when the plant has done this. These happen to be cranberry beans. Okay. They're, they look a lot like lima beans. They look a lot like um, pinto yeah. beans. Okay. So let's like let's them. let's take a look. Let's kind of dig in here and let's see what we've got. Okay. Now I told you that when the when the when the plant is finished and it's matured the beans, uh -huh. like a light switch goes off and it wants to shut down. So for instance. You look here where, where the, where the, it is set and it's finished these beans. These are dry holes. Mm -hmm. Open that in your hand. Okay. 
Oh, yeah, they are dry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So those are the cranberry beans. They look a lot like the pinto, just the color. They do. The color is totally different. Yeah. But it's a but it's a wonderful bean to eat. Okay, so I can eat the seed. Those are ready. Those are ready to go to the to go to the pot. So, so just because it, the leaves turn yellow doesn't destroy the bean, I can eat this already grown. Oh yeah. Okay. The, the leaves are turning yellow because a plant is telling you I'm ready to come out of the field. Okay, I'm, I'm done. done. I'm done. Now okay. all the pods haven't finished. Okay. So and that's just that's just kind of how it is. Drying, you mean? Huh? All the pods haven't all, finished drying. All the, no, all the pods have not finished Growing? have not finished producing. Okay. Like for instance, you'll see these. The bean is just very you know just beginning to start okay. in them. Okay. Okay. Some of these the bean is completed. Okay. But we've got two markets for this product. Okay. We've got one market that wants to buy the bean in the shell that's fully matured. Okay. And that's for this one of the stores. They want this product just like this, with the bean fully formed in the hole, Okay. they'll buy it this way. Okay. Our other markets want it dried just like that and packaged. Okay. So, so it depends. We're starting to pull these plants, we're setting up our dry racks right now and we're starting to pull these plants out and get the beans on the, on the dryer. We have a thresher that we run them through, but we're getting them we're getting them up and on the dryer now, so mm -hmm. we can because our our clock is running out for for us for okay. for the heat hours that we've got. Okay. Um, here on this side, we've got the beans. On this side, we've got cucumbers. We've got cucumbers going. We've got a vertical system that we grow our cucumbers on. Mm -hmm. I see the um, cucumber right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and there's one there. Yeah. So they're. Um, they're in stages. We don't. Our customers um, dictate, you know, the the, the size of, cu of cucumbers that we harvest. Those are too small. Okay. So we'll come through and we'll harvest all the cucumbers that are about nine to ten inches in, in length, mm -hmm. and all the other ones that are that are shorter. Those are about six inches, seven inches in length. We leave them behind. Okay. And we'll 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 take those. We harvest twice a week. So these plants will these plants will, will will push out twice a week with okay. cucumbers, and we'll do that we'll do that on that kind of a schedule. Again, remember this is a late field. We have an early field that cucumbers have been going for I don't know how long okay. from the very very beginning. Okay. Now you'll you'll notice in this one because this field is really rough. We've got a lot of different things growing here. We've got watermelons that have that have uh, sprouted from last season, and we didn't. We didn't bother with the plants, we just let them go. We've got another cucumber. This is an Armenian cucumber mm -hmm. that's growing here. When you're using, when you're planting and you're using open pollinated seeds, we're an organic farm. Mm -hmm. Everything we do is organic. Mm -hmm. And typically of all the varieties that I plant, almost everything that I plant is open pollinated. Okay, and why is that? A couple reasons. Um, philosophically, for, philosophically for me, I understand that organic, that the open pollinated plants are more vigorous and they're stronger. Okay. Let me give you an example. For the most part, um, people are learning in school to use the F1 hybrids, mm -hmm. to, use the, to, use the, to use that plant, those plants. Okay. In commercial production for corn, they want to make sure that all the corn is growing at the same height mm -hmm. when, you, when you harvest, it's, mm. all at the, it's all at the same height. But now when disease comes through the field, you have a copy, you have a carbon copy of everything is just about the same okay. all the way through the field. God didn't do it that way. Okay. With open pollinated, when disease comes through the field, it only, it's only catching plants here and there and here and there. Okay. Because their gene structure is not identical. They're not identical copies of each other. Okay. Each one is a, you have the same product, but they're individuals. Sort of like our DNA. Yeah, just okay. like us. We're individuals. So okay. disease will not hit the whole field and just run through like fire okay. and take everything out. Okay. It'll, 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 be, it'll be dispersed like that. Okay, well what about, so, what about heirloom? Is it, is it necessary for it to be mm -hmm. heirloom or can it just be open pollinated and organic? It can be open pollinated organic or heirloom. Heirloom just gives a distinction that it, it it's an older variety of seed. Okay. And most of your open pollinated is just about going to fall in that category. Okay. Yeah, just about everything will. Okay. So again, like you see, I don't know um, from this plant, it's they may have one. come through and taken some of the uh, I saw some of the cucumbers off. The Armenian cucumbers. Yep. And it's one that the market really enjoys. 
Uh -huh. um, and, of all, and of a lot of the varieties of cucumbers, it's one that I really, I really like. You do? Yeah. Oh. It never, it's never bitter, no matter what size it is, it's still great. And you see a watermelon growing in there, but like I say, this is a late field, so our attention isn't really strong here. Um, there are, here's another one. Now, our meaning cucumbers, they will shock you at their size. Like, here's one growing here. And it's like zucchini, they'll get to like a baseball bat size. Wow. For, for, for a squash. For a, uh, not for a squash, but for a cucumber. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. But look at that. Wow. Oh, it smells wonderful. The seed, mm. it has a small seed cavity, but all that outer is meat. Wow. And it's not bitter. Wow. Yeah. Taste it. Even as big as it is, it's a it's a very, very nice, crunchy, mm. very mm. flavorful cucumber. But it's very flavorful. When it's it, very it, good. Yeah, but it doesn't it looks like it's like, oh who's gonna eat that? Right. But, but it's really nice. It looks it's yeah. delicious. Yeah, really nice. Oh I put it back in there, I'm sorry. No worries. It's fine. Okay, so what do we have over here? What are these All right, let's, little peeking ups? Let's let's walk let's walk through the let's walk through this. <clears throat> Now we've got a few different things growing here. Um, here, this is this is edamame soybean. Okay. And they're drying out. Now, these are ready to go to the market. In fact, we've gotten calls for these already. But that's the that's the edamame soybean. Okay. Mm-hmm. Try to get it out. Yep. So I can taste it. That's it. Mm, nice and fresh. It has a good flavor, too. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So. Really good. And then there's there's just a scatter of black beans. Now, another thing, don't worry about, in your soil, when you're planting, you're going to have a, you're going to have a variety of how plants are performing. With the same nutrients, the same things in it, this one happened to have a heavier cast of organic matter in it. Uh-huh. And... So the, so the balance was not quite right for some of the beans. So the take is a little bit lighter, but since most of these are shedding down, they're ready to go. That's why you see like a, why you see things pretty light on this end. Mm -hmm. now, on the, now from a few hundred feet up, the balance is perfect. Mm -hmm. And they're growing completely different. I see that. Yeah, they're okay. growing completely so different. So this is heavier organic so, matter. Yeah, so it's just, it's just how things work out. Now we're we're uh you're at the end of your tomato season. Tomatoes are uh tomatoes are a tough one for us outside in this climate because most of our summers are well over 100 degrees. The days every right. day is just about 100 plus 100 plus 100 plus. Mm -hmm. When tomatoes are at that heat, they will drop the flowers. When tomato when it's really really hot for tomatoes, they will flower and just drop, flower and just drop. Mm -hmm. Only when it starts cooling down these next two months, all these plants will start loading up with tomatoes like you can't believe. Right, there's, I see some now. There's some on them now. In fact, um, yeah, here are two beautiful ones here. Those are just, those are just, those are the beginners that are just now starting to set. But here's, oh, this wow. is a, uh, th these are heirloom tomatoes. Wow. And that's, that's one of the varieties there. But that's, that's about, probably about three quarters of a pound. But most of these, these are Caspian pink. Um, mm -hmm. We've got Aunt Jenny's green. We've got also German, German marble stripe. Mm -hmm. We have um, about five or six varieties that we have planted here. Yeah, my favorite is the Cherokee. Yeah, Cherokee purple, we do have some Cherokee purple. Um, I want to ask you a question about mm -hmm. tomatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, with my experience, um, with the, the green, um, hornworm mm -hmm. and uh, other bugs that are really attacking the tomato plants and how to prevent that because yours are green and beautiful. Mm -hmm. I don't see very many holes in your leaves. Uh, no. What is it that you've no. put on them? No, t I'll, t I'll tell you something. Um, I've done nothing to these tomato plants except wow. just except just just use the, the amendments in the soil. Okay. But here's the here's the difference. When you live in different places, like this is the desert. Mm -hmm. Our soils are sandy. It's hot, 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 hot here. Okay. There are just certain insects that aren't comfortable here in that in, yeah in that in, in that environment, and that's 
That's that's the advantage that we have with the with the tomatoes. Okay. Every now and then I will get caterpillars on my tomatoes, but it's not a problem because there's there's so many tools now that are available organically. Mm -hmm. Your neem product is an awesome one. Right. For caterpillars and anything that's eating the leaf. Okay. Now with the neem, you have either derivatives that have the oil mm -hmm. in them, or you have products that they've extracted the oil out of it and the active ingredient and you have a dry powder mm -hmm. or one that doesn't have the oil. Right. But that product will stop caterpillars and leaf eating insects from feeding immediately. So the it neem right oil away. can be immediately sprayed but the powder has to go through the soil. The powder no the powder you're going to you're going to hydrate the powder okay. and 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 spray it through it cuz it's it should be at a concentration where it'll go into a into a sprayer at about 100 micron okay. for the fineness. It'll go into solution. It's chelated very well, so okay. it'll go into solution really nicely. Mm -hmm. And you can apply it to the leaf of the plant, and that most of your most of your insects that are eating the leaves and destroying them, it'll stop them immediately. They won't feed. I mean, just right now, they'll stop. Okay. Now right. there's some great contact sprays for organic. Most pyrethrum products are very very good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. But just keep an eye on your plants. You'll notice when you've got caterpillars and they've got to some size, they're, they're, the mandibles are serious. Mm -hmm. They will they will chew a stalk like that like nobody's business. Yes. Yeah. I've had some. I've, I've learned they're, the time that they come out and mm -hmm. I've destroyed most of them that were in my garden. Good. But I had to educate myself to understand how to get rid of them. Okay. But um, in the future, just to not allow them to even attempt to come onto my plant, mm -hmm. the neem will work well. Neem works well. It's a good product okay. and there's quite a few products that are out there. Azosol is one. There's there's several. Since we're a commercial farm, we're buying product in in bulk. Okay. And most most of the time that's not that's not a, that's not very comfortable for the homeowner that wants to get product. Right. Unless you get together with three or four families, mm -hmm. then you can buy the product commercially. If it's not a registered product, you can buy it commercially. Okay. Because you're, they're, most of the companies are going to force you to buy a gallon of product. Okay. Yeah, like the pyrethrum, we use the Pyganic. That's another very good one for knockdown. Okay. It's $400 a gallon plus. Wow. And a gallon for an, for an average homeowner would last years, you know? Okay. And it's just, it's too much to put there. In one, okay, because you space. only need a small amount because it's concentrated. Yeah, it's a concentrate. So you, as, and as a homeowner, you wouldn't use very much. You'd okay. use a small amount. Okay. But for us, we're using gallons, plural. Okay. Yeah, I when see. we've got issues. Are these ready to eat now? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, that's a small one. Wow, these are huge. Um, Zach has just gone out to the to one of the back fields to take to harvest melons. We've got an order. We didn't have enough to finish, so so and then she's coming with more. But but it's it's time for uh, that's our that's one of our early fields for okay. for watermelons. It's planted. We'll start it. Just as soon as the last indication for frost, we'll start the we'll start our watermelons. These are Jubilee; they're seeded uh -huh. watermelons. Uh -huh. We don't do anything but seeded watermelons amen, here. Amen. But um, but these guys are these guys are ready to go. Okay. And you notice in the tractor, um, they're they're really careful with the melons. She puts in um, something soft so they're not uh, wow. not beat up. Okay. Yeah. So they don't get bruised or cracked. Yep. So we'll let Zach go ahead with the. Thanks, Zach. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. Okay, um, Now each one of those are about 30, 30, 40 pounds each. Wow. Now this is a, again we're pick up where we were. This is, this is, this is a late field 
of, of watermelons kind of straight down this band. This field is about, this is a short field, it's 275 feet in length. So the watermelons go all the way down to the to They're the bottom. In. Okay. We've got an interruption in there with with uh, with some with some winter squash. Okay. But you can and you notice the sizes. The sizes are completely different than the than ones those. on the on the right. trailer. But but these, by God's grace, by the end of September, they'll be the 40 pounds, the 30 pounds um, that you're looking for. That that you know that we want. Okay. Now, I wanna. Let's see. I'm going to get a knife because we're going to we're going to go to the backfield and we're going to cut a watermelon open so we can see if what it looks like, All right. see if it's any good or not. So we'll go we'll go um, we'll just kind of move through this field real quickly and uh, and just look at some of the other things that are growing. Now, with watermelons and walking through them, when it's late in the season, I'll just step on everything like it's a carpet. When it's early in the season, I try to place my feet if I need to to get them under a vine rather than stepping on a vine because I still have two more months, about, 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 about six weeks, not two months. I got about six weeks of growth left on these plants okay. before they shut down. So it's just about trying to place, place your, feet, your feet nicely. Now, this is a cantaloupe. It's a variety that's specific to Nevada. It's called a, a hearts of gold. They, they're real high sugar. It's a nice, nice variety. Um, and I want to just kind of, and just want to try to check and see. There's some in there. I'm looking for ones that are on the more mature side. Now, again, here's a cluster of just, yeah. There's smaller ones. There's probably, I don't know, 10 or 12 or 15 in there, just in this little, mm -hmm. little spot right here. And what is this leaf? This this plant that you see growing here, um, that she's that she's marking. I don't know how many of you um, that are sitting and watching, how many have seen this or you have it in your in your garden. Do you have this in your garden? I do believe I do. Yes. Okay. This is called. If he's going to zoom in at the leaf, so you can really get a a good indication of the leaf. This is called mallow. Oh. It's a weed. We call it a weed, uh -huh. but it's an edible plant. Wow, yeah. mallow. Everything, everything about it is, is, is edible. The seeds are edible. Now it'll make a wagon wheel type of a seed. Okay. Yeah. Yep. It'll make a wagon wheel type of a seed, but, but it's an edible plant. Hmm. And it, you, you can eat the, you can eat the leaves. They have no particular flavor to them mm -hmm. or distinction mm -hmm. um, they're very neutral very very neutral the plants are so you can eat them like salad mm -hmm. just like a salad wow. now yeah they're neutral they don't really have a flavor yep yeah, they don't have a flavor so they're great in salads mm -hmm. it has a deep 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 root system so a lot of nutrients and mineral, minerals is pulling up it's it not a, a it's not texture. one you want in your uh it's really not one you want in your garden much, but but I might as well benefit from it. If again, I this it. is a late it's a late field, so we've just kind of let some of this just just move along like it is, without um, in our other fields. Typically, we won't do that. Now, we've got. A couple things interspersed here. We've got Jubilee melons growing in here. We've got one volunteer. Wow, it's a big one. Yeah. So our cantaloupes in this field are... Now that's one that's ready to go. Okay, and how can you tell it's ready to go? Um, there's two things. The color, mm -hmm. it'll start to change. That when the net is fully formed on the cantaloupe, mm -hmm. you know that it's it's um, you know that it's getting closer to maturity. Okay. Also, the vine will release it on its own. On its own. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I see a large one. I think down there. Yeah, there's there's a yeah, there's quite good. a few large ones in there. Yeah.
In fact, this is another one. Now this is something else that happens with the cantaloupes, is that if they stay in, they'll start to, they'll want to start to split mm -hmm. um, for size. They want to start to split. We're going to get a knife. Um, we're going to kind of go through some of these things, all right? Okay, I'll hold this. Yeah. Do some taste tests. Now, here's something most places people have issues with. You'll have issues in your field with insects mm -hmm. or bugs or what have you. Also, there's an issue with wildlife. Um, yes. Here we've got, we're next to a river, so we have abundance of wildlife. We've got of all things, coyotes mm. that come in and they eat watermelon. Now, this is the first. We've had raccoons, um, skunks, and as he pans over just a little little ways, you'll see a large watermelon that was ready to eat. Wow! And and they have uh, they have enjoyed that probably last night. Yeah, they really cleaned yeah. it out. Yeah. Last night they came in and they uh, and they finished that one. So what we do, and you can tell that it's a large animal because they'll just lay down, they'll lay their bodies and it mats the, mats the plants down. Uh -huh, they just that. lay down and they just enjoy. Uh -huh. They just sit and have a watermelon Yeah, for the I can evening. see they've been laying through, mm -hmm. the, uh, mm -hmm. through all of here, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. Now what so, kind of squash do we have over here? Okay, this, we've got a couple different um, winter squash that's growing. These are on the late spectrum. Okay. So, this happens to be butternut. Oh, my favorite. Yeah. Now, we don't know if we'll... We always plant late to just see what happens, but mm -hmm. this, this round is butternut. Down at the very far end, we've got, a, uh, we've got another winter squash that's coming in, and I've already, I'm already seeing that we're getting light frost. Okay. This is the burning that frost does. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's frost burn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those are, that's a frost burn. And it'll... The other night we had some cold nights that, that, that dropped down, and that's the, that's the type of burning that happens on the leaves. Okay. And when it comes hard, game's over. It just shuts everything down. Wow. What we do is, is we'll... Like this area, we'll protect it as we start getting, because it's a late crop, we'll put cover cloth over it. Okay. And the cover cloth will take six degrees of temperature. It'll, it'll give you that, that much lift of six degrees. But the cloth takes the hit of the frost. Okay. So that the plants don't, they don't take that impact. Okay. And you pull it off in the morning after it's frosted, you pull it off around when it starts warming up, the sun comes out. And then just set them to the side. The next day, you'll put them. You'll we'll apply them back. You'll put it back on. That evening, you put it back on. Okay. So let's go to our, let's go to our back field. Okay. Um, let's go to the fields in the back. Okay. Um, we're gonna make our way back through this, and and then head over to one of the other fields. Okay. We, this year I, I, I did an experiment down here by the by the by the river. Okay. I have for a long time, kind of kept this area clear. Turned in a lot of organic matter. A lot of grass that'll grow and different plants. Mm -hmm. I just keep rototilling it, rototilling it under. So I just thought, I said, you know, it's, it's, um, there's a lot of water here. I've got sand soils. I want to put some plants down here and just see how they'll grow. Mm -hmm. So had one of the ladies come down and put some seed in. This is a banana squash, by the way. Okay. So we put the banana squash in, put the seeds into the sand. I don't water this. I do nothing to it. Every now and then, I'll come through and I'll fertilize by the foliar leaf, by the leaf. Mm -hmm. And it's doing, it's performing better than some of the ones in the field. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, I want to kind of move around to the opposite side of it. Mm -hmm. And if uh, we'll move around to this side, and he'll start to pick up some of the fruit that's on it. It's loaded. I see. And they're if huge. You'll, if, you'll, if you'll kind of pan in a little bit. That one is huge. No, banana squash grows really big. So they're there, and you'll notice additional sets that are coming. There. Yes, I An see additional them. set. Mm -hmm. You've got these that are that are um, that are that are trying to set additional ones in through here. Yeah, still they're still flowering. I don't know how flowering. well my, I don't know how well the bees the bees are working down here, but they're doing a little bit of work. And you come back to this side.
and you know the squash they're there wow they look very good mm -hmm. too yeah these are the banana squash this now, is a younger plant, plant so they're not nearly as mature as the ones in the other field mm -hmm. but they're uh, they're on their way but what this is is if you have a stream bed or a stream area um use it yeah yeah use it yeah, you probably you probably find that you have to do you have to water little to almost none mm -hmm. with the plants that are there wow now this happens to be a wonderful place for Beautiful. animals to come down if they've taken something out of the field to come down and eat and it's quiet and nobody's bothering <laughs> nobody's bothering them. and it sounds nice the water sounds good but there's beans that are growing down here and we didn't plant beans we oh. got you got beans growing now here I see them what kind of beans are they now I'm not sure because I didn't I didn't plant these beans here this is one that's vining it's it's uh, mm -hmm. so typically the ones that we plant in the field are either the cranberry or black beans sometimes are green beans okay yeah so they could have gotten anything and, and, and come down but let's let's uh, let's keep moving through I want to show you something else okay here's another one of those uh, banana squash this one's been there a little longer. Wow. Well, we've got a watermelon that's growing down here. Wow. And it's big, too. Mm hmm. Great color. So. Really doing well. And actually, a stream bed is, because we've, we've got sandy soil, a stream bed works out really nice. Watermelons put down deep roots. Your winter squash sets deep roots. Watermelons will set roots down as, as, as far as four feet. Wow. Yeah, so for them, it's the midday, the heat of the day. There's no stress on the leaves whatsoever. Mm -hmm. No stress at all. Everything is just running along on, on point. Don't do any watering of these plants at all down here. Got a baby one growing on here as well. Mm-hmm. Yep, another one set there. Wow. Very so, nice. This is so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. In the desert. So even in the desert, you can grow food without any, any issue whatsoever. Amen. Um, if you apply your hand to it, Try to learn the science of how the plants grow. Mm -hmm. God said that He would bless. Amen. You know, and the and the abundance would just be it just be tremendous. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, Amen. So we're gonna make our way to one of the other fields. Okay, we're in one of the back fields, um, and right now it's it's harvest time for us, and we're doing watermelons back here. This is. This is winter squash. This is a few few rolls of winter squash. We've got a few varieties back here. This happens to be a Queensland blue. It needs a lot of area to run. It's they just I'm, it's, it's 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 unbelievable. But the plant will do probably about 20 feet to the left and right of the center of the plant. Wow. <laughs> They'll put out a lot. Wow. Let's try to get a. I want to try to allow you to see what they look like now. Let me let me let me just share something because winter squash and watermelons have deep rooted systems. Mm -hmm. They have deep root systems, and they have very broad root systems that 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 spread really out. spread out mm -hmm. surface as well as tap. So your preparation of your soil is really important. Okay. And where you'll notice that this field, this is the first year I planted in, the, in, in this field. Mm -hmm. So balancing things, you know, gets to be kind of interesting on your first your first run in the field okay sometime you'll get it right and there's areas where they won't be things won't be right but the point about preparing the soil and the deep root systems this plant is getting to the point of maturity or almost time is up on it mm -hmm. but you're noticing that now in the in the leading in the leading um, branches branching off in the vines that it's showing signs of deficiency. The leaves are smaller, 
they're curling up, they're a bit tighter, mm -hmm. and that just tells me that the plant wants more food. Now, in a contrast, note these at the very tips, and then note the one right there as it's coming down. Much broader, wider, the leaves are a strong green, right yeah. to the very, very tip. Yeah, they're a lot darker. Yeah, that tells me that that plant is healthy. Mm -hmm. The whole plant is feeding, and it's, and it's feeding very well. Mm -hmm. And this one, at this particular one is not. But I wanted to show you the Queensland Blue so you, you can just identify what it is. It's always interesting moving in these areas. You just have to be careful where your feet are going so you don't interrupt the plant. But that's what that winter squash looks like. I don't know if, our, if wow. we can get a good shot for okay. you okay. to be able to see. Now another thing, I'm going to move over so our, so our camera can kind of get in a little tighter. Now, if you want to know when your squash is getting ready, when the stem starts to get corky, you see how this how this stem now is starting to show, starting to show a a beige line, like like a yeah, beige line, but we call that corkiness because it's it's not the smooth green fibrous look. Okay, it's like the like the like the stem is splitting and widening and it's showing more of the inside, mm -hmm. that lets me know that this, that, that that fruit is just about mature. The stem is corking out. Now we'll cut it and let it cure, and then, and then that's, you know, that's that. But that's the Queensland Blue. It's a very nice winter squash. And you cut it and then cure it? Or you don't let we'll it... cut it and let it set for a few days. You mean you just cut it at the stem? Cut the, okay. cut the stem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cut at the stem. Leave the stem on the plant always. Okay. And let it kind of cure down. Okay. All right, who has a knife? Ah, uh, I gotta go. I gotta go get a knife. See, see, they're they're enjoying treats, and 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 we can't enjoy treats until we go back and get a knife. <laughs> now, now, what, now what, what are you eating? Now, the, we're gonna the, we're gonna see these okay. we're gonna see these melons as we go up. Okay. But what they're eating is a it's called a Hyogen melon. Okay. It is, yeah. That's our favorite. Yes. But it's, it is it, it is it is really really nice. It's a really nice melon. You, we'll we'll sample some and, and show and we'll show you guys later what they look like. Okay. But we have about what three four five six varieties of melons that are growing. Sample right now. You want to sample? Ah no no no. We'll we'll get one sure? later. Yeah. Enjoy 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 your break. Thank you. Yeah. Now they're harvesting they're harvesting spaghetti squash right now. And one of our stores requested that we bring them some of the smaller spaghetti squash. So she's taking them out now because they're ready to go. Mm -hmm. And I see I'm gonna adjust this, yeah, adjust that on there. So yes, so there, she's busy getting the getting those getting those out. Um, okay, we walked a little ways away. Let's go back. Let's kind of go back this direction. Can I take your stick? I'm going to take your stick. Do you have another one out here? Okay, all right. Now, I wanted to show you the contrast of this outside line right here is that spaghetti squash that we saw down by the river. Uh -huh. but we'll go around to the back of it. Now right here behind our behind our, our, our camera is this is called a, a hulahan. It's another it's another type of winter actually no, this is the this is the uh, carnival acorn squash. Okay. That's a carnival acorn. Ribbed, um, deep rib, nice color to it. Um, but but now here's something going on. You see this plant? that's yellowed out. Um, the plant is telling you that it's not happy. It's, it's got a nutrient deficiency, and that happens in your field. Now, everything around it looks, looks fairly well, mm -hmm. but you'll get spots like that, that you probably, your broadcast of, of phosphorus, your broadcast of potassium and your magnesium, it wasn't an even broadcast, nor was the incorporation even throughout the okay. throughout the field. Okay. And as the plant gets bigger and its demands are greater, then it's going to tell you, hey, you know, I don't have enough food. 
So that's one thing to just note as you're making your soil application. The soil's a foundation. It's it's critical, critical, critical. And so it's the, at the start that at the, the very, critical work is done. That's exactly right. At so now beginning. in a case like this, is there any way that I could feed it and it's, keep it healthy even with our liquid fertilizers or anything it's, like that? It's, it's possible at this point. Um, I don't do it in some circumstances just because, but it is. You can apply your nutrients that are missing mm -hmm. that are not stable in the soil, that are stable in the soil, the ones that don't move, mm -hmm. you can apply those foliarly and you can bring a plant out of that circumstance. Okay. Yeah, you can, you can, excuse me, you can bring them out of that condition well enough. Okay. Um, so if you've got plants in your garden and they're st you're starting to see signs that, that hey, I've got deficiencies, they're not growing well, um, you can definitely make applications to, to bring them out of that condition. Okay. Now, here's the, here's the same, that same winter squash that we looked at but with the, with the bottom turned up. This is a carnival acorn right here. Beautiful. It's a, it's a nice looking, it's, it's a nice looking plant. Mm -hmm. Nice looking I squash. Like it. Yeah. And it's in a good sugar, good to eat. Um, now we had a mistake on our seeding when we came through here. Um, and things happen in the field. This was all supposed to be winter squash, all, all these all these rows through here. But one of the workers, we asked them to come over and, and, and seed on that side watermelon. And by accident, she thought that I meant these lines. Mm -hmm. So she seeded all these lines with watermelon. Okay, and so they're, we came in, back, they're intertwined. Yeah, they're all intertwined. Now, I knew they had watermelon in it. But I said, no, go ahead and plant the winter squash over the top. But we have kind of a kind of a collage of watermelon and winter squash, and they're uh, they're, they're 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 making it okay. Well, they're they're from but the just... same family, kind of, right? <laughs> no, they're different families, but but anyway, it's sometimes it's kind of fun just to see how things will come I out. I thought watermelon was from the Swaz family. Is that incorrect? You know, um, because it grows similarly on the vine and produces. You it's know... a it's it's a vine, but but it's it's definitely definitely in a different. Uh, I think it's in a different group, okay. but let's, that's something I can go back and do, do some, do some homework on. Um, another small winter squash here, this, this happens to be a hula hand. Um, that one's not as mature. We'll try to find one that's mature that has really good color to it. They're, they're a nice, there you are. It grows flatter. It kind of looks like the, the, the carnival acorn squash, but more like in a patty pan style mm -hmm. with a round bottom rather than a sharp bottom to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's just see. Just kind of meander our way through. And we're back to our spaghetti, back to our uh, banana squash back here. They'll be about three feet in length. They really get to be a huge, a huge, huge squash. Um, and when, what's the particular harvest for them, or is it throughout the harvest season? Harvest for us is just about. We're 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 only weeks away from taking these plants out. I wanna, I wanna bring your attention back this direction. Um, that's more. There's a couple in here that are more typical. To that are more typical to size. That's just about, that's, that's typical, that's, that's, that's more typical for spaghetti squash. Or uh, not spaghetti, my goodness, for the, for the banana squash. They really get big. Now that's too big, that's too big for any one person to eat. But what's now, I want to bring your attention back again. But what's, what happens with these is we'll take is these will be wrapped and cut. I don't know if you can see that. If you can, if you can get in there, so you fill see in that portions or not. instead of yes. the whole yes. squash. Okay. Yeah, because they're just too big for any one person. Okay. So we'll keep moving. Um, they're harvesting spaghetti squash right now. We can just walk our way through, place our feet as best we can. Now, 
everything that's watered here is is on a drip irrigation system and you'll see the lines the oh. bed is about the bed that's prepared is about four and a half four and a half feet in width okay this stick is four feet so you see the line spacing is about four feet okay. but the bed itself is about five to six feet in width okay. and that's the that's the amended area from from about that point to this point is the amended area of of soil Okay. With nutrients, organic matter, the walkway that where you're standing, I put nothing here. Okay. But all the all the nutrients are in this bandwidth. So this you, band just, you just fertilize the row that you're going to plant in. The row I'm going to plant. That 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 conserves a lot of material. Right. And yeah. money. Yes. And money. Mm -hmm. So alongside. So is it is it recommended that you have three, normally? Well, uh, right I, where I, the. Where I do that because I've got I've got. I've got heavy plants that are that are in this area, so I put three to make sure that this whole band is wet. Okay. Remember, I mentioned with winter squash, they have a broad, they have a broad band of, roots. of surface roots that spread out. Right. So I want to make sure that the the majority of this area is wet, so that so that they're not constrained and they can they can just okay. set their roots as far as they want to set them. Okay. Mm-hmm. When the spaghetti squash has, has yellowed out, plants are setting down, squash has yellowed out, it's ready to come off. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what they're harvesting right now. They're getting all that, all that product in. Because um, we've already started to get frost hits through here the last few days back. So basically this whole field is squash and melons. Nothing squash else. and melons, that's it. Okay. And this field is watermelons, as you'll see. Um, as you see out to, to out and we've harvested a lot of watermelons out of here okay. I don't know how many um, I don't know how many how much weight in watermelons we've taken a lot of watermelon out of this field already do you think there are any watermelons over there that are ready to be picked oh absolutely but can you show us how to pick a ripe watermelon yep. um, Valeria did you harvest all the watermelons that are ready yes. okay you think you forgot any <laughs> Whereabouts? Where should I look? Down there where the flower Down toward that, that far end? Right. Okay, all right. Thank you. If we can make our way, just keep meandering our way through. Okay. Um, we're still going through, through the winter squash. Now, right now we're harvesting spaghetti squash. I just want to tell you how I just want to tell you how how good God is. When you're using drip line and we we noticed a drip line earlier. Here you see one that's over the top of this watermelon. We're going to come back to this watermelon, but the watermelon grew underneath it and pushed the drip line up. Mm -hmm. But what happens is is we've got gophers mm -hmm. and that are gophers as well as moles under underneath the ground and what they'll do is when an irrigation line is on the top, they will bite into that thing to get the water. Wow. Yeah. And I'm on a mode right now where I'm traveling a little bit, mm -hmm. so I'm not always at the farm. Usually, everything that we water is on timers. This year, we didn't put things on timers because we got more fields engaged. But usually, everything's on timer. Timers, I'm running two hours in the morning, maybe an hour in the evening mm -hmm. to, to, to water everything so we don't have to have that something to do. But they'll break the line. So this this row that has spaghetti squash on it, it did, it did without water for almost almost I think about a probably about four or five six days. Wow! That it didn't get water and it started stressing the plants. They didn't die, mm -hmm. but it started stressing them out. The f because the gophers had bit the line and very, very water very little water was coming through the center section. Mm -hmm. The front was getting it. And one of the lines was still good at the very back, and it was getting it. So what it did is it d reduced the size of the of the spaghetti squash. Okay. Now one of our customers, they they would prefer the smaller spaghetti squash for their for their for their customers. They want the smaller squash because a person that's a single person can eat it, and because a lot of people don't eat leftovers, they'll just take whatever's remaining and toss it. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, in America, we waste a lot of food. We do. We waste we a do. lot of food. Typically, really the spaghetti do. squash is going to grow to a size that will, 
it'll go to a size these are immature because this is a younger plant but it'll be that size and larger i want to try to find you one that's more let's let's come this way that's more that's more typical of a spaghetti squash and how it'll grow and it'll get a little bit bigger than that before it's ready to cure down so you can bake that cut it open scoop the spaghetti scoop the squash out of it and then do your sauce or take it and transfer it to a bowl and put your sauce and so forth in it and it'll it'll feed two three four people okay. you know one squash will so they you know they size up and they size up well but now a, a lot of movement is to the smaller stuff so that we can just have a meal one time and toss what's remaining and then have something new tomorrow mm -hmm. it's it's a reckless way to eat but that's where we are before the irrigation systems um how can we prevent the the rodents from biting um or we've, would it be is there a better system that we can use that they can't bite through yeah we've done a couple things and i think i'll show you i'll show you it as we go to to the top field okay when we go to the top field i'll show it there's a there's a there's a rigid hard line mm -hmm. that's this is a this is a drip tape so it's when there's no water it's flat you see how it's flat right right but this is a this is a more rigid line that has emitters in it now it's it's thick so it's too thick for them to bite into. Okay. They just they just ignore it. Okay. Yeah. We've gone to that in a lot of the fields to avoid the problem with having the the rodents eating the lines. Okay, now you now, did say that when you were um, traveling and even before that that mm -hmm. you water your melons and your squash Yes. Uh, uh, two hours in the morning and an hour in the evening. Yes, when they're now, on timers, yes. While they're on timers. Mm -hmm. Now, is, is but, it because of this climate? It's because of this climate, because they're really hot. So what I'll do is I'll start the water in the morning mm -hmm. before the sun comes up, you know, really strong. Mm -hmm. And I'll water them. Everything is on the ground now, no, mm -hmm. no overhead. So I'll water them so when the heat of the sun comes up, they're not in stress. Okay. They've got plenty of water and then... If they've gone through without water for the balance of the day, I'll I'll hit them with another 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 choice of water. Okay, depending I, on how hot it is. Yeah, I want our cameraman to to just kind of see the tool that she's walking with. That's a Honda power carrier. Now each one of those containers, there's six on that on that cart that she's walking out of the field with. Each one of those is probably about 70 or 80 pounds each with squash, and it's a, it just happens to work out as a nice tool to be able to harvest and to move out of the field with as a track vehicle. So if it's sandy or muddy or otherwise, mm -hmm. you can just you can just move you can move out of the field with it. Right. They're not so expensive. They're not available in this country much, but there are some in the country that can be gotten. Okay. But it's just a it's a I just want to mark that was kind of a nice tool. Now we wanted to check and and just look at the watermelons. Yes. She wanted to know how do we how do you know when a watermelon is ready to eat? Right. Let's let's take a look. We're gonna we're gonna we're going to look at this one because it's a it's a fair size one and the drip tape is over it even we've got another one out here so that one's a, that one's one we can look at as well what you want to do if our camera can come to the opposite side we can we can get a uh, we can get a we can get a good indication as what we got going now watermelons are easy to harvest because they tell you they communicate very very well with you so you want to find where, where the plant is feeding that melon. And, and we see here, there's a principal vine passing through on this side, right? Mm -hmm. Now, and that's where it's feeding in for the watermelon. At that intersection, there'll be a tendril. Mm -hmm. You see that tendril? Mm -hmm. It looks like a curly cue on a, on, on kind of a, on a, on a little stick. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he can, I don't know if he can, he can get a good shot at that. Let's move some of these other things out of the way so we can get some sunlight. Now, now that's the, my finger's on that one. That's, that's the curly cue that you want to look for. It's a tendril. When it's dried up and it looks like it's dead, that watermelon's ready. Okay. As long as it's green, it's not ready. It's not ready to go. Okay. But when it dries up and, it's, and, it's, and it looks like it's, it's, uh, it's dead, it's ready to go, it's, it's time to harvest. All right. Now, you'll notice something here. I've got a line going over the top, and we've got an irrigation line at the bottom. Mm -hmm. This is that hard, rigid irrigation line that I was telling you about. Now, this one is still doing well. You see it's wet. 
This is a very strict, wow, very, very strict hard line. Uh -huh. But what happened was in the center, sometime we'll, we'll use different systems. In the center, we had one that was, that was bitten. So we ran, we ran another, another one in to replace it. If we're replacing line in the middle of the season, we're gonna just, we're gonna run them over the top of the plants. But I do wanna say something about watering and how, and how we water. Um, let's, I just wanna wipe that. If you're watering overhead, everybody won't have drip systems to work with. Uh -huh. So if you're, oh my goodness. If you're watering overhead, if you happen to be watering overhead, never water squash or any large broadleaf plant in the evening. Okay. Yeah, especially if you're in, a, in, you're in an area where you've got high moisture and high humidity. Even here in the desert, I won't do it. Okay. And the reason why, if I'm watering overhead and I water those broadleaf plants in the evening, the leaf won't have time to dry off. Okay. So it makes a prime condition for powdery mildew. Okay. And once powdery mildew starts, you can control it and you can, but it's typically gonna, gonna it's gonna win. Okay. It means now you've got to start spending money to try to address to try it to and to deal it. with it. Yeah. But okay. if you're watering techniques, if you're watering, if you've got to water overhead, make sure that it's early in the morning so that the plant has time to dry off all throughout the day. So typically we should water at the lowest uh, level and we should do it, you know, a court we can do that in the evening mm -hmm. because we're not spraying the leaves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. If, you're, if your water's on the ground, you can water at night without any problem. Okay. But if you're, you're overhead watering, don't do it with broadleaf plants. Now, we've got another melon right here that's kind of tucked in. Let's just check it and see. We've got to find the, we've got to find the- The tendril? The, this is the blossom end back here. So we want to find where the, where the plant is feeding it. And this is, we've got a lot of vines crossing, but here's the, here's the feeder right there, move that vine out of the way, and that's the tendril that we're looking for, right okay. here. And that one looks, oh, okay, this that one, one. Okay. That one's, that one's nice. I see and, one on the top that looks dry. Yeah, you this see that is, one? that, yeah, that's, that's coming from, from this one. Okay. And it's really good that you've got to try to identify, because you want to make sure that the one that you're looking at is the one that's, the one that's feeding the plant right okay. here. So that's the one that's feeding the plant. Okay. Here it is, and it's, and it's green. Okay. It's fresh and green. Okay. But when that dries, when that's dried down, it tells you right away that I can, plant's I ready can to harvest. go. harvest. Yeah. It's time to harvest. Excellent. Now, is this a plant that you grew, or is this just a weed? This is a weed. Okay. As a matter of fact, that's a very invasive weed that the whole state is working very hard to eliminate. It's called white top, and it's um, we'll dig this one out. They set roots, and there's another one. Uh -huh. This field, if you if you look around, it's got irrigation set sprinklers, overhead sprinklers. We don't use yeah. those, but they were in this field when we started farming. And what that does is they're pulling water directly out of the river, and the seeds for this plant are in the water. Oh, okay. So as you broadcast it, you move that seed along. Now, um, are there any uh, plants or vegetables that we can water overhead or we should? Oh yeah, you can, almost all of them you can water overhead. The issue is, is just, Don't do it in the it's just in the evenings when you've got a big leaf, like our, like the winter squash, okay. it has a real wide leaf to it. Okay. So that's a lot of surface to dry down when you're getting, the sun is leaving the sky, you're getting close to the evening hours, okay. you don't have much wind, that moisture will stay on the top of that plant. Okay. And then with, the, with any measure of heat or humidity, it just works out really well for powdery mildew to begin. Okay. And you don't want to, you, you want to avoid that at all costs because that's going to make us having to start spend money with treatments of copper or otherwise to try to get rid of that mildew. Okay. Yeah. So. All right. Anyway, we're going to move through, move through these watermelon and. So, um, why? In the rows, there are no weeds growing in here when we're basically on the sand or the dirt in this area. Okay. Um, this greenhouse, this, this greenhouse is, a, uh, is, is on a hydroponic system. 
<laughs> it's an advanced hydroponic system, a sand hydroponics. Underneath this floor is a EPDM liner, 16 inches down beneath is a rubber liner uh -huh. that goes up to the each, <coughs> excuse me, on each side, uh -huh. all the way to the end. There's okay. two separate cells, as it were, mm -hmm. or bowls. Okay. This is one on one to the left of you and one to the right of you. Okay. And and then sand is placed. There's appliances that conduct the water subgrade from one end to the other. And then sand is filled over the top of those appliances. Okay. And all your nutrients, all your water runs beneath. So all you have is the, everything is growing in sand directly. How do you put the nutrients underneath after? The nutrients are, pu are put into the water. And the, there's okay. A, there's a well that's, there's two wells right there, right by the door. Okay. That where the water comes into underneath the floor. Uh -huh. Now sand has a wonderful property called capillary physics. It has all water moves up, up into sand by capillary physics. Okay. It's just a capillary action. Uh huh. And the neat thing about this floor is I can, I've, I, I've planted just about everything inside of it. I've done tomatoes, done sweet potatoes, done roots, done everything in here. And the plants choose where they want to be. Okay. The plants make their decision where they want. Okay, outside in or in. Perfect oxygenated area or they want more water. Now, for instance, I've done sugar cane in the back. And the sugar cane goes all the way down to the water mm -hmm. underneath. There's taro growing here, just starting some taro. Mm -hmm. Taro, typically, if you, if you know taro, it wants to be in wet, swampy areas. Mm -hmm. So the roots for this one, same thing, will go straight down to the bottom of the floor where there's always water. Okay. Rather than up into the sand where some of the other plants will want just a, mm -hmm. you know, just a... Uh, and the scallions, they look like they're doing okay. Mm -hmm. They're coming in. All right. We do a lot of onions for, uh, for uh, bunching onions. In, in here? Mm-hmm. Most okay. of this is basil. This okay. is uh, this is this is a sweet basil. Mm -hmm. it smells and good. we've cut back a lot of these plants, and we're gonna let them let them. We're always cutting and bringing plants back down low, and then back again. Okay. Uh, managing flowers. Um, yeah, the basil is beautiful. It smells great. Mm -hmm. We're doing seedling starts of basil, mm -hmm. and that will move into pots. Um, to, to take to some of the stores. Some of our stores have requested that they want the they want the basil in pots. May I pick this so up? So we'll do that. Mm -hmm. You're more than, more than welcome. Oh, okay. I wanted to ask, how, how do you get it? Just You just pull it, dry it, and pull it out? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it looks like, now, because it's wet, yeah. I wouldn't be able to get it out. Now this one, this this tree, this tree was sitting over on that side. Uh -huh. I see she's brought it over. Mm -hmm. But this ha doesn't have to be basil. This isn't, this is kale. We've got two varieties of kale. We've got the curly kale and then a, then a lacinata kale. That's what this, that's what this one is. Okay. So this is the, this is the basil. Okay, this is basil. Yeah. Okay. Basil. Now, if if it, it grew to maturity and I wanted to plant it in the ground, how would I get it out of here? Okay. Underneath this, there are, there are holes. Okay. So right now we're ready to start taking these guys out. You see the roots coming through. Uh huh. That lets me know that. That they're ready. It's ready, but I've got too many. I've got like. So you know, yeah. basil seeds are really small, so I've got about 15 plants in here. Uh -huh. So it's time for us to pull these out, separate them, put them in separate pots, okay. and, then, and then get them moving. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay, and the rest of this is just basil. Mm -hmm. Just sweet basil, with the exception of a few different things here and there. Now, along the side of the building, mm -hmm. you'll see vines climbing up. Mm -hmm. Those, they're Congo watermelons that oh. are along the edges. Okay. Um, in fact... If we found an aisle way to walk down, we'd probably walk right into one of the melons. Yes. I don't know if our camera can catch it or not, but there's a about a 40 pound Congo melon going inside the greenhouse. Wow. Now basil is an herb in the mint family. You just have to kind of keep your feet on the ground almost and kind of move that way. But he got, he's got it. Yeah. Now what, what are these over here that are growing? We've got two, this is rhubarb. Okay. That's, uh, that's growing in the, 
that's that's growing in in here and then along the side are some melons yes yeah, some, yeah okay mm -hmm. i saw the squash leaves over there yeah. okay. and that lone plant with the really small leaves that's thai basil really yeah right here mm -hmm, that little mm -hmm. small one mm -hmm. with the very small leaf that's thai basil take one in your hand and just rub it in your hand okay And then smell it. Mmm, it smells good. It sort of has a licorice smell yes, to it. It smells yes. delicious. <laughs> wow. And yeah, it's really, so vibrant. The yeah. smell is so vibrant. Really nice. Really nice. Really foods. nice. Um, mm. Yeah, and dishes. It's really neat. And this is Thai basil. That's thai basil, yeah. You heard it, folks. Get some Thai basil. It smells awesome. Mm -hmm. But the sweet basil is great. Nice for the pastas nice for pesto but basil we send basil every single day almost to the stores wow There's no gap with basil yeah. so this is a high producing uh product mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. loves the heat this greenhouse right now if you'll pan over to the to the it's about 110 degrees in here wow we turned the fans off because of the because of noise but it's about roughly about 100 and Almost, almost getting close to 110 inside. So how hard is it for the average person to get a greenhouse? It's not so bad. You wouldn't build a structure like this because of the regulatory issues that we have. The greenhouse has, this greenhouse has to be built to a, yes? It has to be built to, to withstand 100 and, 103, about 130 degree wind okay. forces. Okay. Okay, do you like okra? Well, I don't like okra because it's slimy and Probably it gives me best, a creeps. Huh? Okay. I'm not saying the flavor's not good, but I won't eat it because of the slime. What, what I want you to do is try it raw. Okra is Yikes. awesome raw in salads and other, other things like that. And it's not it's slimy? Not even slimy, I'm telling you. This, <laughs> you're you're this sure is, it's not slimy? This variety of okra is called cow horn, so it makes a really long, long, long pot. And, and immediately it would tell you, oh no, it's too old because you know, they're too big. But we'll try to find one that's, that's, that's tender, and I think this one is. Um, that one's not bad either. This younger one is. Let's try this younger one. Okay. All right. Now, bite into that. All these are organic. We don't spray anything. Um, we don't spray any pesticides. I don't, I don't even touch okra. There's nothing I do to it. Okay, I'm going to bite. Okay. It's not slimy? It's not slimy. And the flavor's nice. The flavor's great. Yeah, the flavor is nice. It's very good. No slime. I never would have thought about putting okra in salad. It's it raw. It is. It's 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 something different. It really does. It's taste something good. different. It's really well, nice. Who knew? The I flavor of okra is in it. Mm -hmm. But it's not. But it's not. Now our, our it's very nice. People can't see it, but our cameraman. I want him to try as well. You can't see him eat it, but we're gonna cut one for our cameraman to take. Don't eat the, bite the top off and then bite it. And you'll see, you'll like it. Now see, that's not bad, is it? No, it's not bad at all. It's yeah. very good. Yeah. So now, um, this is carrots, right? Yep. We've got carrots in here. We've, this is, uh, this is the earliest bed that we plant. Mm -hmm. And then some sweet corn that the birds have gotten into now because it's, we, we didn't finish it all. Okay. But these are carrots. This is a, uh, um, can I pull up a carrot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go up toward the toward the front a little bit more. Okay. We're a little, a little sandier. Okay. And I think we can get them out. They're, we always we're always watering carrots, so let's so, see. Right where you're right where you are. Okay. Right where you're at. Wow, that's a now, big fat now some carrot. Of, some of these have gotten to juicing, but I want I want to get you one that's more more uniform. Okay. Well, how do I know when it's gotten to juicing? Can you explain that? Well. For us, when our carrots get really big, we uh, we start mm, sending them out for so juice. Smells so good. But that's more that's more appropriate in size. Yes. Yeah. But this is good for juicing. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And for you juice. can eat the leaves. Yep. And put them in your salads. Wow. Now he gets a proper carrot. Yeah. Those are. Wow. Crazy lords.
Now what do we have over here? Um, we've got, let's wash those carrots. Oh, okay. It's all well water, so it's uh, wow, really, really nice. Let me do you as a brother, Bridges. <laughs> wow. Okay. Let's try it. Nice and sweet. Let me wash that one for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Touched it. Knowing the truth. Awesome. Sweet and crunchy. Mm. Sugar's okay in that one? Mm-hmm. Good. Mm-hmm. Good. I love carrots. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got a lot of they've got a lot of good things for us. Yes. So this is a growing system that you're using mm -hmm. for let's, let's let's go out to the outer edge to, and we'll for plants grow. to grow. Mm -hmm. I mean a climb up. Mm -hmm. We train the plants up these up up the uh, now something happened this season. We we trial a lot of a lot of equipment. A lot of uh, we trial this system. It's a new system and. Let's walk along this outer. We'll walk down this aisle here. Now, I want to show you something. We're always we're always testing things and just trying, just kind of testing the limit. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see on this one, we added very little, very little amendments for organic matter. Now it's sand, 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 sand. Mm -hmm. What we did is we put the we put the nutrients in the soil, added almost no organic matter whatsoever. And the night and day difference between the performance of the plants. You look at these. Now it's it's getting cold now, so these are starting to yellow down, and 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 get to that point because they've got no nutrients. These melons here, from this row to this row, on these two and this first section, next to no nutrients in the soil, mm -hmm. just a very little. Um, keep, let's walk on down. I want to show you the contrast. Now this is where the nutrients began. We started adding nutrients, right? I started adding nutrients right here. Look at the difference in the plant. Wow. In the color, the size, mm -hmm. the melons. Everything. What kind of melon is that? It's very this is interesting. A, this is a crane melon. Okay, a crane melon. Mm -hmm. C R A N E. Very nice. Um, now, we have a vertical growing system where cups are placed underneath these. Crane is a really tough vine. It will hang this melon without, even without the cups. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I've had melons much bigger than these, and they'll and they'll hang. But we've got appliances to set underneath them to keep them. But our goal, the goal here is in, in growing vertically. This plant will put out. Right now, this is right now we're at, we're about six and a half feet here, mm -hmm. and these vines <coughs> have already started moving horizontally. <coughs> so one plant will give will put probably about twelve. 12 feet of vines. Wow. Now, if all this, what you see on this, this, this row coming up, if all these were laying out, we couldn't walk between it. But I can train these vines to go up. Instead of out. Instead of out, still have the same, have more set of melons, mm -hmm. because now the flowers are more accessible even to the bees. Okay, because they're up and they're we not do, down. Mm -hmm. We do double rows, so you've got two, two rows of melons growing side by side. Oh, I see. Where so and you use the uh, black plastic on these. We use the plastic to, to hold the heat in the soil. Okay. And to give us our early start to hold the heat. Mm -hmm. And then to also even to keep the moisture in the soil. Okay. So there's two reasons for that. And so the watering systems come here and they just water the, over the holes. Mm -mm, the irrigation lines are underneath the plastic. Okay. They're running beneath it. 
Okay, so you yeah, cover the them as well. Yeah, okay. drip line is running beneath the plastic. Water comes in. It's the soil is heated by the plastic. Mm -hmm. The moisture from the irrigation stays inside because it can't evaporate through the plastic. Right. So you're you're saving both, but you're getting your early start for heat. Okay. Yeah. So, but this is a yeah this is a crane melon. Um, we didn't bring bees in this year, and I think we're noticing the difference. So normally you bring bees here. Yes, we bring bees in because we just we just almost just have to have them. Okay. Yeah, in order to get in order to get what we want. Let's keep coming on down. So is this the bowl that you were talking about that the melon sits on? Yes, that's it. That's the okay, cup. Okay, those are the cups. Yeah, those are the cups that the melons sit in. That's exactly right. Okay, cucumbers that are now, now see our leaf hoppers. I'm noticing our leaf hoppers have come in at this oh, side. Oh, this is a nice cucumber. Mm -hmm. Very nice cucumbers. Yeah. So I do see the leaf hoppers. Yeah. So this one now I need to come through and uh, I need to come through and start dealing with these guys. Now this but one looks melons, really large, like. Mm -hmm. This melon, actually this melon is complete, it's ready to harvest, but it's hanging free from the plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing underneath it, it's just hanging free. But the plant is able to handle that, that's five, that's about four pounds of melon, or almost five pounds of melon that's hanging there. So we don't have to worry about the tendril on this one? No. Okay. When it completes its net and, it's, and it has a rough face to it, that melon's ready to go. All right. Yeah, the crane is pretty easy that way. We've got one in the aisle that's come loose. On its own? Mm-hmm. And this one has come loose on its own. It feels different from a cantaloupe, smoother. Yeah, that one, that one didn't quite finish. And that's because it doesn't have enough netting on it. Yep, doesn't have enough netting on it. It'll still ripen and be, and, and, and probably be really nice to eat. So should we lay it back down and let it ripen here? No, it's okay. yeah, yeah, you can, or we can, you can put it in one of the refrigerators. Yeah, it's okay. And even though it's late in the season, the melons are still, still, still continuing to set. Wow. Still got, still got a lot of sets here, there. The plants are just gonna, they're just gonna continue. Mm -hmm. I see a lot just, of baby ones on the other side mm -hmm, as well. To just set melons. Now what is this, Brother Spence? That's just a, that's just a, a weed. That's oh, okay. almost like the lamb's quarter, but that's a, that's okay, a weed, that's a weed. Okay. coming in. All right. Now on this side, we've got cantaloupe. This is the Hearts of Good cantaloupe, mm -hmm. and you see, um, you see one on the line there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see that. Wow. We have vertical systems for this, for these guys, mm -hmm. but the products were made um, overseas, some of, the, some of the pieces, and we didn't get them in in time. Okay. So we just abandoned our vertical. We'll, we'll, we'll continue next year, next season with it, because we'll have all of our components in. Okay. But we had, we had another component that was missing. And what I, we do is, is we, we use this, we use the stakes as you see them, and there's clips that go on, the strings run through just like you, just like you see here, mm -hmm. and we just train the plants to go up those, this, train okay. the plants to go up those lines. Okay. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. All right, well, we appreciate all the education that we've gotten, and we thank well, you for allowing us to come to this beautiful farm. Well, I've enjoyed the visit, glad you guys have come, and I hope, uh, hope, hope you come again. We will, yeah. and uh, in the future, we hope that we can get uh, a few more educational classes and maybe some hands-on demonstrations. And that's that's very good with me. It's very right. fine. Be All happy right. to do it. All right. From, All right. From uh, Nevada, we, we say just, goodbye. We're just outside of Reno. Yep. Bye bye. Take care. God bless. <laughs>